May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you were able to come to last week's 9 o'clock or 11.15 service, you most likely heard a wonderful sermon from a wonderful woman and writer, Nora Gallagher. After participating in a very successful Womankind put on by Anne and Carmen and so many of you, I'm glad that she was willing to offer some of her insight to all of us this past Sunday. Nora spoke of her time with illness. She spoke of how it changed her perceptions of herself and the world around her. She spoke of how it changed her perceptions of God and God's action within our lives. From a traditional view, Nora spoke on how we as Christians and members of the church talk about God in terms of power, title, and position. We know Christ as king and sovereign. We know Christ as healer and fixer. We know Christ as powerful and perfect. And when we pray in times of illness or tragedy, we often use these beliefs in such a way that our souls cry out in what Nora describes as the 9-11 prayer. Help me. Make this go away. Often, all of us, and for good reasons, find ourselves praying to a fix-it God that is little different than the character Samantha found from the classic show Bewitched. Yet in prayer, and even in times of illness, we often forget that God can and does interact with us in different ways. When she was ill, Nora spoke of her time of healing as a process and a journey. It was something that would not go away simply because she wished it would. It was something that she must work alongside with, with countless people, patients, friends, nurses, doctors, and God. And through prayer, time, and silence, she understood that God was not simply a distant physician, but also a present help in a time of need. God was a suffering servant, sharing in her same journey. God was a friend that never left her bedside even when visiting hours had ended. God was intimate, patient, present, understanding, and hope-filled. Hearing these words reminded me of my own times of vulnerability and loneliness, where only later did I recognize a wonderful presence around me, about me, and within me that was all too familiar. I too know God as suffering. I too know God as servant. What I love about her words and insight, aside from the truth I see within them, is that she rediscovers something about God that we often forget. Again, we know God as king, wonderful physician, but he's also suffering servant, exemplified through Christ on the cross. It's a hard thing for Christians to move beyond our initial understanding of God. What often draws us into relationship with Jesus Christ focuses on a particular aspect of his identity or his actions or his words. To find narratives in the Bible that offers something more or different from what we know can often be difficult or unwelcome. To be very honest, when I learned that I was going to preach on today's gospel, I said, good Lord, no, not this one. <laughs> but, but it happened. <laughs> At least that was my first reaction. And though there was difficulty in picturing our blessed Savior as anything but the miracle worker who refuses to cast the first stone, who feeds the starving masses, who heals the infirm, and speaks up for the voiceless, we cannot forget that God and Jesus are more than we simply want them to be. Along with Jesus who preaches peace on the mountaintop, we have Jesus who turns over the money-changing tables in the temple and casts out those who would turn a house of prayer into a den of robbers. 
As Christians, followers of God, we must be willing to acknowledge these competing voices and find truth and unity within that message. I believe the same applies to narratives where Jesus talks about sin and human responsibility. In the gospel regarding or reading from Matthew, we see Jesus focusing on aspects of the law. He defines and redefines what is, in his mind, to be right living before God and community. With these uses of obvious hyperbole, in some instances he talks about cutting off those things in our lives that cause us to continually fail in doing what is good and just for others. Jesus talks of how we are to reconcile with our brothers and sisters. Jesus talks of how easily it is to hurt somebody for individual fulfillment or gain. The alarm and intensity we feel in these words are not meant as personal indictment, but to highlight the very real spiritual destruction that occurs upon our various communities, known and unknown, brought on by the self that continually chooses to do those things that God does not. That's what sin is. To actively, repeatedly, and without concern or difference of opinion, do those things that we know in our hearts, individually, that we shouldn't. His concern, therefore, is not simply for the individual, but for the body of Christ on earth, the corporate entity of believers. With this glimpse of who God is, or rather what God wants in the Gospel of Matthew, I must be willing to add this to my picture of God. Instead of God simply being powerful king or wonderful physician, suffering servant, personal savior, I must add God as community organizer, perhaps. I see Jesus as one who not only understands the worth of the individual, but that of the community of Christ. The same love and concern that is given to the whole is, just, is, is received just like it is for the individual. And Jesus, in this gospel, shows this concern and love by instructing those who are hurting themselves and others. It's not an easy image of God that we perpetually keep in our mind. It's hard to have a God that expects something from us. It's hard to have a God that shows love not simply by nurture or mercy, but by straight talk, if you will, telling it like it is. These images often combat a previous held vision that we have of God, which we find hard to incorporate and easy enough to reject. But I believe that the great truth that I have learned about my relationship with God is that right when I think I have an understanding of it all, right when I think that I really know what's going on, I'm throwing a curveball, and I know that I have to keep searching. But again, it's hard to keep searching. It's hard to find courage to look deeper into our faith past that initial spark which brought us together as a community, brought us into a relationship with God. In many ways, all of us can be, as Paul describes, his first followers in the letter to the Corinthians. Aside from those of us who are lactose intolerant or vegan, all joking aside, we long to live a spiritual life being fed with spiritual milk because it's simple. We long for spiritual milk because it asks very little of our minds and bodies. It's safe. It focuses more on us than on others. It focuses more on us than on God. Yet if we trust that God will complete in us the work that was begun at the time of our baptism, and we desire to grow spiritually, we must be willing to take on that solid spiritual food that Paul prays for on behalf of his congregation. This ability, however, takes time and effort, much like the time and effort it takes for an artist to hone their craft in a way that does justice to the visions and ideas that originate in the mind. Recently, I listened to an interview with Ira Glass, who was a known writer and radio personality for NPR's This American Life. The topic of his interview was on harnessing creativity as an artist. In part of the interview, Iris stated 
that he wished he'd been given some advice when he began as a writer. He noticed that often creative people fall into doubt. In the beginning, they are never told that the work they will produce will not match their vision or their taste. They know where they want to be, and for years, they know they aren't there yet. For many creative people, doubt sets in, and they give up. Ira wants himself to remember and others to know that even if we never achieve the heights that we envision in our minds, our work shows potential. And potential is all that we need to keep moving forward. But to realize this potential, he says, one has to do a lot of work to close the gap. It's going to take a while. It's normal to take a while. But soon your work will be as good as your ambitions. Much like his words on art and creativity, I believe Ira's message applies to us as persons of faith. To know God and love God is a beginning. Many simply stop there. To be stretched to know God in new ways or challenged by God in how we currently live our lives can lead us into moments of doubt or complacency. To work toward incorporating these new visions, as hard as they may be, helps us to realize the spiritual potential that lies within all of us. It helps us to know God more fully and love God more authentically than simply a few attributes that we find comforting or agreeable. May you find courage to delve into your experiences, your faith life, your Bible, and, and search the unknowable depths of our God. And upon your journey, your courageous journey, I wish to offer you a little advice. It's going to take a while. It's normal to take a while. But soon your work will be as good as the God who created you, who loves you, and pushes you to love others. Amen. Amen.